The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. On an all-new Get Real, Sri Lanka at the crossroads and its path towards success. The Sri Lankan economy will take a massive hit due to COVID-19 in the next few years, according to latest data. However, the saving grace is that we have the information and the platform needed in order to thin the blow. Sri Lanka's inflation is to rise in the next year as disruptions to supply chains and food shortages impacts the overall growth. The way forward, according to many analysts, is that Sri Lanka needs to look beyond its usual bread and butter and venture into areas that would eventually open new opportunities for the country's businesses. East Asia, Africa and the South Americas are up for grabs as successive governments here in the island have only managed to barely scratch the surface of these potential high earners. What can we do? How can we tweak our approach to the world and ensure that in the end, we come out on top? For a fresh look at Sri Lanka's new possibilities in trading with the world, tonight I have the pleasure of welcoming the Vice Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Wish Govindasamy. From Studio 24, with opinions that matter, it's time to get real with Mahesh Jani. And a very good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me on Monday's edition of Get Real as we dive deep into issues that's faced by everyday Sri Lankans. Tonight, our focus is on Sri Lanka's economy and its potential to grow in the post-COVID world. Where will we see our next opportunity? Or will we keep knocking on the same door, hoping for a better result? Or will we carve our way towards new heights? Well, in my opening statement tonight, the fight for greener pastures. As you all know, Sri Lanka and the rest of the world will take a massive hit to the economy due to the dire constraints created by the coronavirus pandemic. Since the beginning of this year, most of our plans to grow out of this country and uh, to grow the economy has come to a definite or a partial stall. We had a good run in curbing the first wave of the virus and now in the second wave after the Brandix cluster bloomed, we now have hit more than 35,000 cases of COVID-19 infected people and the death toll keeps rising as well. So this day and age, safety of health is a commodity that's now being sought out by many in the world. The term health is wealth has a new meaning post-COVID. What we all want to know right now is when is this going to end and how fast can we bounce back? The answer remains with all of us. If we use our heads and if our leaders strategize this moment to harness the potential rather than focusing on the doom and gloom, then I think we have a shot at coming out of this very healthy and very happy. Let me explain this numbers game. As of now, according to KPMG, they expect the impact to Sri Lanka's economy from COVID-19 to be at a higher level than any other country, mainly because most sectors that generate income in this country being at a standstill during the whole of this year. KPMG analysis shows that inflation is expected to stay at an average of 5% this year from around 43 in 2019. This was driven by high uh, food prices and supply chain disruptions followed by a marginal decline expected in 2021 to be at around 4.8%. However, the tax concessions introduced before the outbreak are expected to mitigate pricing pressures. This is not just for us in Sri Lanka. On the global outlook, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has announced a global recession, one that is likely to be worse than the financial crisis of 2008. 
So if we crunch the numbers and put it in simple, understandable language for all of us who doesn't get this mumbo jumbo, well, basically what they are saying is that everything is going down the crapper. So what are the solutions we have in order to ensure that we survive the pandemic and the post-economic pandemic that is to hit? We all know that it's coming, unlike the warning we didn't get with regard to the COVID-19 virus. So we need to take heed and ensure that we plan accordingly to face this crisis. Our economy depends mostly on foreign trade. All our income generating avenues are by selling our main products to the world. And over the years, we have managed to establish ourselves in several markets, mainly Europe and America, and we've been very comfortable in them. Lest have we tried to look into other markets that could actually be of a potential benefit to us. The biggest exporting products in Sri Lanka is mainly tea, textile and electronics and, it's, uh, and IT services, uh, which uh, brings in about $11 billion annually. Our main export partner as of now is the European Union, the United States, India, China and the UAE. Let's put that all in a map. Despite the fact that we are there in these biggest markets, look at the areas we are not even thinking of exporting our goods to. For a simple example, Africa. We are not even batting an eyelid aim towards Africa. We have been so boiled and cooked in the colonial mentality, we think Africa as a continent that's rigged with poor people and all the disasters under the sun, lest we've given any consideration to actually what's happening in that continent. With a population of over 1.3 billion, uh, according to estimates in 2019, the African region is a diverse and dynamic grouping of countries with a combined GDP of over 6 trillion US dollars. 6 trillion US dollars. Sri Lanka's diplomatic engagement with the region uh, dated back to the 1960s. Yes, we have dip diplomatic relations, but not trade. And there are a number of areas where Sri Lanka could improve its existing economic and diplomatic linkages in order to create this. In a recent study done by a think tank called International Consultants based in the UK showed that Sri Lanka can generate 8 billion US dollars in external revenue through investing countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, the DRC. Now, the Democratic Republic of Congo is the richest country on the planet. It's where you find abundance of natural resources like oil, gas and rare metals and the list goes on. Right now, they have not tapped into it. So because of that, they remain poor when it comes to economy. The DRC has the world's largest deposit of coltan. Now, coltan is used primarily for the production of electronic devices like mobile phones. That's over 60% of the world's entire coltan stock. To this day, the industry, although still booming, is relatively underdeveloped compared to what it could be. Sri Lanka has a massive potential there as we can export our expertise in construction, cement and other services. It is estimated that the entire DRC holds about $25 trillion of untapped minerals. That's about the same amount of the GDP of the USA and Europe combined. The DRC is both the richest, yet the poorest country on the earth. There's so much potential. So Sri Lanka has a lot to offer in terms of economic development and selling our products and services to this country and actually creating a rich partnerships with a country like DRC that could benefit both. This is out of the box thinking. No longer can we just sit here and keep knocking on doors like in Europe and America just barely scraping the surface for opportunities. Whereas some parts of the world, there are untapped markets which we have not thought of being there in order to harness its potential. Look at South America. How much of trade are we doing with South America? Which has a similar cultural climate like ours in this region. Sri Lankan textile can boom up in those markets. But why is our entire textile industry hell-bent on the GSP Plus and the European Union? Why not even send an exploring mission to those areas and try and figure out 
where we all can benefit. If South America or Africa is a tough bet to get into, then why not look at countries we are already working, like Australia? There's a rich Sri Lankan diaspora in that country who's flooding our markets here in Sri Lanka with Australian products. Are we doing the same with them? Our exports to Australia in the past few years barely reached $200 million. Where the Australian economy is $1.3 trillion, rather, $1.3 trillion strong. If Sri Lanka continues its trade practices based on what we did in the past, then buckle up, folks. We are in for a rough ride. All right, in order to talk more about uh, Sri Lanka's economic and trade uh, future, the Vice Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Wish Govindasamy, is here shortly. But before that, here is Dani Dwitanamasam with the real story of Sri Lanka's current trading practices that has resulted in the economy we now work. Mahesh, Sri Lanka has been classified as an upper middle income country by the World Bank. This feat has been a challenging one as it was achieved in the midst of natural disasters, terrorism and in certain instances bad policy decisions. Following 30 years of civil war that ended in 2009, the economy grew at an average of 5.3%. The Sri Lankan government has prioritized steadiness and structure in approaching the 2021 budget, which was a clear stride away from being a welfare-based economy. However, in the year 2019, the economic growth of the country had dropped to 2.3% and contracted by 1.6% year-on-year in the first quarter of 2020. The contraction, a first in 19 years, was driven by weak economic performances of construction, textile, mining and tea industries. Against this backdrop, the COVID-19 health crisis is believed to have impacted economic activity severely since the first quarter of this year. On the onset itself, the government of Sri Lanka quickly responded to the crisis by establishing a cash transfer response providing over 5.7 million monthly payments of Rs 5,000 to households. Payments were made in both April and May of 2020. The total cost was around 55 billion rupees, a 0.33% of the GDP. In evaluating the export outlook of the country, Sri Lanka imported 4.1 billion US dollars worth of Chinese products during 2018, which comprised of 18.5% of total imports for the period. This is second to India, which accounted for 19% of imports. Sri Lanka is dependent across several sectors on China to import raw materials as well. Sri Lanka exports mostly textiles and garments, which amounts to 52% of total exports, and tea, which amounts to 17% of the total exports. Other types of exports include spices, gems, coconut products, rubber and fish. Main export partners are the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, Belgium and Italy. Other major donors supporting key infrastructure projects are Japan, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. According to the ADB's Country Operations Business Plan for the years 2020 to 2022, the proposed lending program for Sri Lanka for the three-year period is estimated to be 2.46 billion US dollars. The program is expected to focus heavily on the development of transport infrastructure. The large trade deficit witnessed in the country for the year 2019 was financed primarily by foreign assistance, commercial borrowing and by remittances from Sri Lankan expatriate workers. In total, temporary migrants are estimated to number 1.9 million, almost 23% of the labour force. It is questionable as to how sustainable this would be when moving towards the future. However, Sri Lanka's new government has consistently shown signs of moving against traditional implementation of policy. One of the greatest assets that Sri Lanka has is its human capital. Currently, they're not really taking advantage of this. From the 1970s, they've been focused very much on domestic workers' remittance, which currently stands probably somewhere around 7 billion US dollars. We should be looking at high-end opportunities, may that be lawyers, doctors, accountants, nurses, professional people to work in the African continent as the economic growth is there and the opportunity is there. I believe that we need to diversify our markets from the traditional market of Europe and the United States. We have to move to other markets and in order to do that we will also have to diversify our product basket. Now. In diversifying our product basket, we should look at adding value. The unique world order created through COVID-19 has called on countries such as Sri Lanka, which has a mass untapped potential, to work differently. 
It is clear that the country would have to let go of historic ways of dealing with the economy and gradually move to new mechanisms. Back to you, Mahish. All right, thank you very much. Danny Dwitana was reporting there. Let's take a short commercial break. When, when we return, Wish Govinda Sami, the Vice Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, will be here and we will discuss on how exactly can we proceed in, with regard to trade and other business matter in order to keep our economy revived and strong. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to Get Real. Uh, well, time to get uh, context to our conversation. We're trying to figure out what we can do in order to make sure that our businesses, our economy will take the hit, whatever that is coming due to COVID-19. Um, as of now, we have not felt it very ha harshly like what other countries are looking at. But then again, if we can plan right now, understand what's going to happen, where the what kind of industries will actually take the hit, and then plan accordingly and face it uh, like we have always faced uh, adverse um, effects, whether it's a disaster, whether it's war, we've gone through this, so it's not like we had to reinvent the wheel. In order to uh, discuss that, uh, I have the pleasure of being in the company of uh, Mr. Vish, uh, Vish Govinda Sami, the Vice Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Good to see you, sir. Welcome Thank to the you. program. Um, well, what we're trying to figure out here, uh, sir, is the fact that, you know, yes, economies are going to take a hit. It's not uh, just exclusive to Sri Lanka, but the world over. So when that is happening, what can we do? What is your uh, outlook uh, in, in the next two years, three years, five years down the line? What do you see? I think, um, you know, economies around the world, like you said, you know, are going through a very, very difficult time. Probably, you know, since the early th 30s when the, um, you know, um, the uh, you know economies got hit badly at that time. The Great but Depression. The Great Depression, yes. But uh, things are different now. We know a lot better than what people knew then. Um, this is, I mean, a virus is not a new thing. There have been many viruses that yeah. people have faced. But the bigger issue is the death, the mortality rate that's involved with this. Mm -hmm. And particularly because, you know, we've been living in a society where travel, right, and movement has been the big part of trade, business, economy, et cetera. So if you look back from January of this year to mm -hmm. now, what has become the biggest standstill is the inability of the human race to mm -hmm. move around, you see? So mm -hmm. that has caused huge amount of effects. So if you just take the travel industry, it's just about collapsed. Nothing. Right? Then you take the tourism industry, it's collapsed around the world. Domestically, certain countries have bounced back who have domestic tourism, right? Or domestic the travel, countries. the big countries. Now, if you take the United States, you know, they can, people can travel. They have figured it out by, I think, June, July, August. Yeah. They figured it out. They can travel. But then when you know Thanksgiving came, they told people not to travel mm -hmm. because close contact, um, you know, joining together, extra issues. But getting back to the economic mm -hmm. downfalls, so those industries need help. You know, how do we resurrect those industries? World over, interest rates have taken a tumble, right? There's every country in the world is printing cash because they need cash to move around to get things done. Mm -hmm. So there's, in some countries, including Sri Lanka, there's excess liquidity, right, that needs to be put into investment. So we have to find the right investments to kickstart the economy. Even during the Great Depression, uh, what United States did was get into infrastructure development. The biggest highways in the world, mm -hmm. in the US, was built during that time. So I think in that sense, what we have started to do here is something in keeping in line with that. Because people need jobs, people need food on their table. Smaller industries need to start working. Mm -hmm. So if you do big infrastructure, a lot of the economy starts kicking back. 
At the same time, you know, we need to reskill people, right? So people in the say travel, trade, tourism, they need to because be reskilled. Because it's a new world. Exactly. They need to be reskilled. They can't sit back and say normalcy is going to take place or there is going to be some handout to me. That won't happen. They need to move, you know, move on. That, so. that, that is one of the things that I, I really want to have uh, the conversation with you, um, is the fact that, you know, we have this mentality that we have to wait till the government does everything. Um, the private sector can and uh, obviously has the ability to uh, plan out and make sure that they can do the necessary changes right now so they can face whatever is coming, whether it, it, if, if it comes, then we are ready. If it doesn't, good. Uh, do you see that happening right now, whether the multinationals or whether the smaller guy, tourism industry, let's uh, take for an example, um, you know, uh, most of the little guys, like if you take places like Hikkadu Ampar, all these uh, touristic area where they were depending on, you know, the, the backpackers, the, the, the little guys who come from, you know, to mm -hmm. look at the uh, entire scenic area. Now, w what can they do, you know, proactively to make sure at the end of the day, hey, we are not going to sit back and take the downfall. We're going to do something about it. What, what can we do? So it's so that's where I think it's not that people are waiting for the government to do anything. Like I said, the reskilling work mm -hmm. need to be done. The you know the labor uh, ministry or the labor department can get involved, right, and help these folks with you know if agriculture is the way to go forward because people need food, right? So they can be channeled in that direction. Agriculture doesn't mean everybody needs to become a farmer, yeah. right? What the farmer produces today can be taken to the end user. So there's so much work to be done there. As you know, you know, we have the post-harvest damage is so huge. If we can put some of these people to make sure that post-harvest damage is not done, because they know to do a job, right? I mean, if you take a for example, a tour guide, mm. right? A tour guide does a fantastic yeah. job uh, becoming an ambassador to the tourist who comes here. So it's not like they're good for nothing. So they just need to be told, you know, there's something else that you could do and still earn a living and go forward. You don't have to forget your tour guide's mm. job, but there's another job for you to do. So that type of channeling, yes, I think even the private sector can get involved in helping these people to go forward. What has taken place big in this whole pandemic is the digitization world yeah. over, right? People are moving. I mean, who would have thought you'd be sitting at home ordering your groceries from your favorite supermarket? You don't have to go there anymore, mm -hmm. right? You can order it. So like that, we have adapted. If you had told you in month of March you will be doing that, would you have believed? Yeah. You said no. But today you have learned. Because our brain out. is so hard coded, we have to go there, we have to pick it, we have to smell it. And, uh, yes, you, you need it uh, in some instances, but, but then you, you figured it out. It. Yeah, exactly. You figured it out. So digitization is going to be the big change. People are going to be doing so many things using digital change. And that is something we have to adapt really fast. Are we, I mean, do you see we as, uh, you know, adapting? Slow, the slow, but I think um, there is a greater push. Uh, the e-government is starting, I see in a small way, even now identifying us when we go anywhere, you know, Stay Safe app is out and we are yeah. using it. It took us a little while. So like that, it'll happen, but at what speed we want to happen is what, you know, how hungry people are. This concept of, you know, handouts, we don't see much here in, in Sri Lanka. We see it in a smaller scale. If you look at the U.S. government, I think they already have now strike a deal for a $900 uh, million dollars in order to dispatch to businesses across America. Now, we don't see that happening. Do you think that is a problem or do you think that there should be some more done on that particular aspect of things? See, it's all about affordability, right? U.S. can print dollars and give and have no effect on their system. The moment this country d does it with our huge debt burden that's there, then we get into more debt. I mean, where is that cash going to come from, right? Whether we borrow domestically or whether we borrow internationally, it's a borrowing. So, you know, you can do and hand out to everybody if you can afford it. It's all about affordability. I don't think the government of Sri Lanka can afford to hand out 
money doing there were way. conversations in the opposition and all who were saying you know we are looking at a, another zimbabwe here in sri lanka do you have that i outlook? don't think so i think they just yeah i mean <laughs> they just it's it's rhetoric um i don't think we are going to go there and i hope so hope not um but you know we need to have some breaks and i think this import thing is a good break while a lot of people won't like it and i know certain businesses are affected by it but it's the right thing to do because some sacrifices has to be why, done why is it the right thing to do because right? like i said i mean the biggest foreign exchange movement is from our imports and if there are things that we can do without for a couple of years that's what i said if you can make a sacrifice right if you don't have to buy a car for the two years you know it's not going to like you're going to die because <laughs> you don't buy a car but if you don't eat you're going to die yeah if you don't have medicine you're going to you know suffer so the priorities have been given to that right but yes there are some businesses that will suffer from that but somebody has to sacrifice right and you know how, you can ask can why they, me but that's how it goes how can they reconfigure their business model in order to take this hit or if you say okay the car car selling uh, you know that industry you know they are they are completely affected but then again uh, you know it's not exactly like you said we won't die just because we don't have a car or we, we you know that that would not happen how can they reconfigure i mean there should be new thinking which i see from my point of view is lacking right now so the whole aspect of service levels right um people can you know have different attachments services lots of things people would have been putting aside uh changing parts for their cars so all that can happen right so they also have to reengineer i mean gives them a chance to relook at their business they've been depended on a fully imported piece of equipment mm-hmm. coming reselling etc what can we do with it let's take a small industry like motorcycles can sri lanka not produce a decent mm-hmm. motorcycle right why why hasn't it happened so that's why so that's the question one has to ask why isn't it happening so you know so that's where i think the the regulator or the government or whoever needs to say i mean look at pharmaceuticals the government has decided we are going to manufacture pharmaceuticals here right against yeah, all right odds decision. right against all odds um you know we i doubted it right but now it's reality it's happening so like that somebody needs to make those hard calls this but ca- we yeah. can't manufacture an airplane yeah right so we because we to, don't have a market for yeah. that either. and no can we do it so we need to decide what can we do what can we do and move towards the ones that we can do that is another another question that keeps arising is the fact that you know we are always very comfortable with the usual culprits tea rubber or whatever we've been exporting so far uh, we have never never successive governments have tried but they have never pushed the market to the level to re, re, you know reconfigure for a simple example let's take uh, apple iphones uh, which is uh, you know being manufactured in china there is a government to government uh, fight in between china and the united states so they are moving some of those businesses to uh, india so india is a place where we can actually renegotiate and bring a little bit of chunk you know manufacture of phones or whether whatever the other product that they have uh, why don't we see that kind of a push you know going towards that level so and those, harnessing those businesses so those businesses need to see some kind of stability right not only in uh, and i think the the one of the debacles for that is we need to have serious labor reform our labor laws are archaic right so those countries where people move businesses to they have the flexibility when they go in you know they can do certain changes they can you know make sure their business doesn't come to a standstill mm-hmm. because so and so is angry and there is 100 guys who don't show up to work etc um then the number of holidays you know we probably <laughs> have the highest number yeah. of holidays in the world yeah right so those are you know difficulties for but highly you, motivated manufacturing outfits but how did we do that exact thing in the textile market where we are already servicing the highest you know quality brands in the world that has been manufactured here in this country how did we do that there and not in other other areas so there i think um 
one of the issues was we were one of the first movers into that industry, doing garments outside the main countries, having garments set up here. So we were the first movers. Our literacy rate helped, and also the entrepreneurs who got into that business also made sure that is helped. But today, even they are facing those same yeah. issues that I mentioned to you about, you know, labor laws, holiday mm -hmm. time, less not productive people. So those are still affecting them. We are no longer as competitive as Vietnam or Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah. Our own companies are moving out to those countries. Why? Because it's better to go and do it there. Uh, so we have to become competitive. All and right, our productivity uh, has to improve. Indeed, a uh, lot of changes that needs to be made, uh, I think, by everyone. I, I guess the government, the regulator, e even the industry. Let's take a short commercial break. I'm in conversation with uh, Mr. Vish Govindasamy, the Vice Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. You're watching Get Real. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to Get Real. I'm in conversation with Mr. Vish Govindasamy, the Vice Chair of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. We've been having a discussion with regard to what the business community, what our economy can do in order to uh, get out of whatever the issues we might face, uh, you know, the next year, next five years, uh, plan ahead. Um, what are the opportunities we have, sir, with regard to, you know, usual suspects, tea, the textile industry, and we are held bent on certain, uh, you know, certain countries. Whether it's the European Union, GSP Plus has locked us, uh, and then uh, in America, the same thing. Uh, you know, tea also is being served into uh, whether it's the Middle East or you know, there are so much of areas and countries in the world who we have not even thought about going into those markets. Uh, where, where? I mean, we need to rethink in that capacity as well. Where do you see we have more opportunities right now? So uh, just like you talked about the products, uh, we also have been generally stuck with the traditional countries like the European yeah. Union or the US, etc. We need to look more on the Asian countries right now, right? Look at the two large giants next to us, India and China, with almost 2.5 billion people put together, right? That is a large chunk of people that we can service to. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very hard to break into those, um, you know, economies and business and export, but, you know, there has to be a way. You know, our embassies in these countries need to be, you know, double, tripled, because they're large countries, right? Um, we can't have one office in New Delhi and another in you yeah, know, the yeah, South yeah. and be happy with. So we need to have more of our commercial officers in different places in India and in different places in China. They need to be educated with the language. We need to have a pipeline of people from the uh, you know, Department of Commerce or Department of Foreign Affairs or whoever who can get into these places and really help businesses that are here. People can produce stuff here. Mm. People can probably find the clientele there, but just connecting them and making sure certain opportunities and data. Today, it's a lot about data. I can produce something here, but if I can get data, say, from China, right? This is, if, if it's, let's talk about, say, you know, a small uh, batik shirt, for example. What are the number of batik shirts that are being sold in China? Who has the highest market share? Mm. What is the average the retail knowledge. price? You know, a lot more than what you and I can find on the website, for example. Mm. So that data today is so important. Whoever has information, right, is winning mm. in all this trade. So we need to really invest in making sure our, you know, commerce department, our embassy people, all that we should have a huge line of people educated in helping the small and medium businesses here, finding those niche, small markets that we can send very expensive product. For example, our gem and jewelry. Yeah. 
right? It is a huge yes, thing that we can double, triple and send and value add. Why do we need to just export the stone? You know, we should be sending finished jewelry. And, and yeah. that, that, is, that is not going to happen overnight at the end of the day. That has to start somewhere. And we apparently have forgotten to start that mm -hmm. uh, at the moment. Do you see uh, the current uh, budget laying the groundwork for something like that? Yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, is this budget right or wrong, for example. For me, it was less disturbance. Usually a budget is that Very comes disturbing. and disrupts and disturbs everything doesn't allow anybody to plan, right? Businesses, we plan for five years mm. at a time. Say, if I launch a product, I have five years worth of, you know, expenditure, uh, all that planned. So when something like the budget comes overnight, changes something, entire plan crashes. So what we are looking for in a budget is a consistency, right? And some longevity thinking. But that doesn't mean people can't change, but don't change things overnight. And what we didn't see is that, you know, certain changes overnight from tomorrow, this will not happen, or from midnight tonight, this will not happen. That just, we don't plan that way. Businesses don't plan that yeah. way. So I think in that sense, there was that allotment. But whether there is a lot of muscle in helping the small, medium businesses, we need to go into detail to find out if that's there. But as long as there is no uh, disturbance, then sometimes the entire tax system is overhauled overnight. You know, it takes yeah. a huge amount of shock to rebuild and come back. So in that sense, I think some kind of stability and thinking is there. And I also would like to say any change done over a you know period of two to three years Right, mm -hmm. so you want to change something, you tell the businesses, you yeah, know, yeah, three years from now, it's going to change. You plan yourself. Then we can handle the shock. So in that sense, it's there. The other thing is like, uh, um, we have this habit, uh, our business community, our governments have this habit where we wait till someone else go into unknown territory. Uh, we don't forge or carve a, a path to that and actually take the the opportunity that is already there like uh, in Africa we are we are, I think uh, nothing to somewhat is what we have uh, our presence even in all the I think around 51 to 53 countries are there in the African continent and we have only uh, diplomatic relations with two or three countries there is a huge market there which is not being tapped uh, a market which we can serve uh, if by any chance, let's say there is a small guy who is creating Bavik shirts and he says, ah, okay, because at the end of the day, the cultures are similar, mm. climate is similar, we have a lot of relations going on. Uh, you know, we want to pander into that. We want to get into, let's say, uh, a Rwanda. Okay, uh, I mean, we have been told... Africa means hunger, you know, famine. That is, a, that is not, not true. true. Yeah. That is not true. That is what we've been hard-coded yeah. into our brains. And our thinking pattern is has, I mean, if you take all the, uh, the history here, is the fact that we have actually acted on that particular mentality. Now, if someone wants to do something, how could they go about right now, even whether it's some through the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce or whether it's the government, where, what is the path? So the first stop would be for a business person to go look for is the Export Development Board, EDB. Uh, I mean, they are, have the capacity and they, again, I hope they have the data that allows people yeah. to know which, you know, of our products can be sold where. And they need to continue to explore. They don't have to wait for a small business to come and say, can I sell this there? It can be the other way around as well, where the Export Development yeah. Board comes and says, you know, these are the opportunities that's available there. I know they assist in, you know, fairs. They take you to certain uh, shows, etc. They give you some grants so that small people can go set up a stall, etc. But they need to do a lot more than that. Uh, if you take, you know, the, the similar offices of, say, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, those countries, they do a lot more in that, in finding businesses for the small and medium uh, enterprises. So that department needs to really, really gear up and find opportunities. And like you said, open a bigger bouquet of 
destinations that we can send our product. Close this myth about Africans yeah, can't afford yeah, it. Yeah. They can surely afford that. I mean, uh, they are producing diamonds. Yeah. They can, you know, afford that we can send from here. Um, so, you know, these are all things that we've been stuck with. So we need to change and snap out and say, you know, we need to go out. That one thing is the export. You know, there's a lot of things that we can produce for the domestic market here that we have been dependent on bringing from outside. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the current government is trying to yeah, do that. Exactly. So I think we need to put a lot more effort in, you know, replacing or substituting imports. Where do you see uh, for the products we have, for the services we give uh, in that entire industry right now? I think the biggest earn, I mean, we only earn around $11 billion through exporting <coughs> our products. And uh, we can scale that up to a very high level. Uh, textile, uh, I think from the tourism industry, we get, get a chunk and all those uh, little, little, little uh, things. Where do you see the opportunity lies with regard to what kind of products, the ones that we have not thought of? So the, the more than selling physical products, selling information and technology is the bigger yeah. trading thing that happens around the world. So we need to gear up our IT ability, like I said before, you know, because it, all the infrastructure is here. You can only transfer. For a simple technology. example, like I want to keep uh, t touching on that sub yeah. subject. Let's take the big companies. Let's take banking services, mm -hmm. HSBC. Uh, pretty much, you know, they are very operative all around the world, but their back office functions have been chunked into whether India, mm -hmm. uh, here in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. you know, little, little places. But whenever they want to come, uh, like what you said earlier on, our policies, our guidelines are very stringent where we, they're not able to. Uh, even, uh, you know, a lot of people know the back office functions that's happening in Rajakiri, a massive amount. But if they want to scale up, there is no support. So, the, where do, where the so some of the obstacle is on, you know, the, the cost of power in this country is too high. We need to really electricity. reduce electricity cost is by far the highest probably in the world. Um, so, you know, that is a basic requirement for that type of industry, mm -hmm. all right? Two, the, what I mentioned about, you know, the human resources yes. and HR ability and, and the education. You know, our education levels, our graduates needs to be fully rounded graduates who can come and work immediately. The practical experience when they come out of our universities or high schools, etc., is very less. We don't have any working culture, you know, as their students. They they don't know none of the kids here in yeah. this country work even a part-time job during the summer break or anything like that. You see? So they are very, very fresh when they come. So we need to get in all those skills. We don't have to reinvent this. People have done this and they're already showing that they can mm -hmm. do. So some of these things has to be built in. Our graduates, you know, the English language needs to be, you know, mm -hmm. brought back because the world speaks that language. But that's the universal language that the world speaks. For business, it's essential. So we need to have that. You know, why are all the back-end offices in India and not here? That's that's one of the biggest questions so because those are actually to, generating a lot of money. So our education system, right? So we need to have better colleges, universities. You know, you know, why are we depending on only it's government universities? We had to get rid of them. We had to no. just scale it up a little bit to the levels that uh, is required by the world market. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see, like, right now, if by any chance, you know, change the education system, getting uh, students to actually, you know, think about, like, in the sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, as soon as they start, you know, coming to a level where they have to think about their future, mm -hmm. do you think that they, the ability uh, is there that they can select, like, say, okay, I want to be an engineer. Okay, engineer, that part, because a school education system like what everybody is saying is what they teach us in nuts i don't think is is relevant up until i mean if by any chance if you're becoming a mathematician yes but for day-to-day -day activity you don't need that kind of this thing so uh, do you think the education system needs to be tweaked in a level that we are actually generating individuals for the market or should they be just you know philosophers and all those things and teaching them everything at the end of the day so it goes back to if you look at traditionally all our schools the effort that's put in sports 
Izmir. You know, everybody wants to play cricket, everybody wants to play rugby. So the, the, the thinking, they go in thinking, you know, if I can get into this school, yeah. I can be a rugby player, I can be mm -hmm. a cricket player. They're not thinking, you know, I can be an IT expert or I can be a aeronautics engineer or an architect or a lawyer, an accountant. So that kind of thinking needs to be brought, right? And, you know, that's why I said the summer experience or break experience is so important. Schools and industry need to work together. You know, kids mm. should be able to come into companies and spend the three months. Then they get ideas, say on the eighth or ninth or tenth grade, if they can spend three months in a law firm or an accounting yeah. firm or an architectural this thing, or even a business entity, a factory, you see, then they get ideas of what they want to do. So keeping them busy during that culture needs to evolve. Mm. Right? Today, if you ask the parents, they'll say, you know, companies don't take. Yeah. Companies need to evolve. If we are going to put money in our future, we need to have that happening. Indeed, uh, a very uh, you know eye-opening discussion. Uh, so let's take a short commercial break. Uh, I'm in conversation with Mr. Vish Govindasamy, the Vice Chair of uh, the Civil Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you're watching it. We'll be right back. Everyone, to get real, I'm in conversation with Mr. Bish Govindasamy, the Vice Chair of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. We've been having a very good discussion uh, exactly what we need to do in terms of preparing ourselves for whatever the economic um, down, downfall or whether, you know, if we are going to have things the way they are. Uh, one of the things uh, that you touched upon, which is very relevant, is the skills um, development. Uh, what I want to keep on uh, discussing about that is the fact that um, we are, as a country, we are not ex exactly attracting the big spenders in the world because we have a mentality, like if you take Singapore, we have this entire conversation, you know, Singapore wants to be like Sri Lanka and, you know, all that nonsense. Right now, we can't even come close to Sh Singapore. You even go and land there, you very well know the quality of everything is really high, whether you go to a restaurant or anything. And every person uh, um, who are the big spenders, whether they are from the Middle East, from Europe, from America, passes Sri Lanka and goes to uh, Singapore. Why, why can't we attract these big spenders, whether it's in the hotel industry, whether it's in the service industry, who wants to come here? They, because one of the questions they have is, okay, we come here, what is there for us to spend it on? We have all the lowest levels of, uh, when it comes to you know, pricing and all. What, do you, what is your take on that? So, I mean, you, you just, uh, and I think you kind of gave the answer, because why do you like Singapore compared to here? because they never stop inventing. They're never satisfied with what they, have. what they have. They want to be better and better. They never think they're the best in anything. If you ever ask a Singaporean hotel or anything, would they ever say we are the best in the world? Never, because we are still continuing to improve. Some of our issues, we think we are the best in, say for example, you know, the hotel industry. We are not. We're not, not even close. Right, so we need to keep you know, developing and, you know, raising our benchmark higher and higher and higher, right? That's when we get better. So training of our people and the mentality saying that, you know, we need to be serving the higher clientele, right? Why do we need to sell $50 rooms? We should be aiming to sell $500 rooms. If you aim at $500 rooms, maybe you can sell at $300. But you but can't you sell a $50, $50 room to, uh, uh, to a 500 level. Exactly. Because so uh, because our quality. thinking is, I want to get $50. I'm satisfied with $50. You shouldn't be satisfied with $50. You should be satisfied $500. So that, that, that entire, that's a cultural change that we need to make. I'm sure Singapore was not like that yeah. when they first started. And they are multicultural as well. So their leadership made that change. Like aim high, you know, pitch for the best. 
So those things, I mean, it, it has to happen from the kindergarten level, yeah. right? That psychological shift has to happen. That's why I keep going back to education, right? I mean, for us, now we can't change. But our kids, the, the future can be changed if we bring that kind of thinking, right? We should never think we are the best and we should never not want to learn from others. We have a debacle of learning from others. We think we know everything. In a lot of our industries, we have that huge issue, thinking that we know better than the others. No, we don't, right? We should be able to learn and we should be able to teach. It should be both ways. And right? in the areas that we are yeah, really good exactly. at. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are I mean, things that we are very good at and then things that we are not good at at all. So the things that we are good, we should be able to exchange for the things that we are not good at all. Where do you, like, in terms of going forward, uh, there is a crisis, you know, all these things what we've discussed right now cannot uh, change overnight. Uh, so we need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think it, I, COVID has given us that opportunity to start. Uh, the big spenders, the big markets, do you think has the potential to come here in Sri Lanka? Do you think they are actually looking at Sri Lanka as a destination to invest, as a destination, yes, I mean, industries that are, that are never here, uh, uh, whether it's the, the uh, maybe the car manufacturers, which we've heard for some time, you know, Volkswagen is coming to Sri Lanka, they are here. Did they think about us? Are they even thinking, you know, do you think the opportunity is there? Yeah, so, I mean, let's take, if I want to make an investment into a particular subject in a particular destination, I look for a key few things. One is the stability, political stability, right? Safety and security. Whether I can get my money back, the investment that I'm putting, is it safe? You know, is it just going to disappear? Um, you know, then the people, are they friendly? Are they hostile? towards my investment. Can I bring my expertise in there? You know, do I have to get permission to bring 25 of my experts there? So these are all the, 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 now if you open a business in Singapore, they don't ask you how many people you want to bring there, right? So you can bring, I mean, it's a, they, they've evolved to that level. We can't evolve overnight. Yeah. Right. So, but then again, we are aiming high. Like you said, uh, Port City is is a project that is actually trying to change that concept mm -hmm. and mentality. Do you think we have the laws and the regulations right now in order to cater to a city like Port City? I don't think so. So, if we, if we, I mean, I know there's going to be a financial center. A financial center means there'll be so many expats will have to come and work there. Right. So, so many expats means we need those schools for those expat children. Yeah. We need places to stay. They should be seamlessly be able to come into Sri Lanka and go out. They don't have to go and stand in line to get an immigration job to stay here. Their children, you know, some people may have their, you know, domestics brought in from somewhere. So all that is a system that we need to be able to have. I mean, look at if we need, a say, a Thai restaurant, you will need a Thai chef to be, if you're going to be the best yeah. Thai food in Sri Lanka, right, and if you're a high spender, if you come, or a Japanese restaurant, you will, I mean, Sri Lankans are good, but, you know, we are good in Sri Lankan food, <laughs> right? We can probably make amazing Sri Lankan yeah. food. But then, if we need to get a Japanese chef in, then the owner should, who's going to invest in a Japanese food chain, like, say, for Sri Lanka, right? Like, say, Nobu, yeah. the world's best Japanese food. If they're going to open three Nobu restaurants, he'll want to bring their best chefs and put here. Are we going to allow it? Then you'll see the big spenders coming here. A very good point <laughs> uh, to keep ponder upon. You actually touched on many areas that we uh, really need to start revamping and understanding exactly. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Vishnu Sami, the Vice Chairman of the uh, Salon Chamber of Commerce. Uh, really good conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for me having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure indeed. Well, uh, that's all we have uh, for tonight. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back again at around 9.45 with World. See you then. I said she took my heart.